just an explanation for some of you who walked in late. Uh, no more toner in the copy machine, so I thought I'd do an experiment. I'm looking for your input on, on the digital, all digital. But you can also do it on your phone, and it's true. You can go to our website and download it there and follow along on our website on your phone. Um, two problems already I know about. Everyone's craning their neck that way, and that's where they're not just, right? Not you guys. But you guys probably especially. And this button here is supposed to advance it for me, but for whatever reason, that has stopped working. So I have to use the one on the side that makes me skip. So I apologize for that. I obviously have some stuff to work on as well. Okay, enough of that. My brothers, my sisters. Our world is becoming increasingly lonely. I don't know if you know this, but it is an epidemic among the, the younger generations that they are consistently feeling more and more lonely. You stop and you wonder how in the world that's possible. We are living on top of each other in a way that we never have before. You look out at the sea of houses and the apartment buildings, and yet people are becoming more and more lonely, more and more isolated, more and more feeling cut off from the rest of their world. You think about the way people live their lives, right? You, you can order your groceries. You don't even have to get out of your car. You, you put it in the computer. You go show up and somebody puts it in your trunk. You don't even have to look them in the eyes. You can have them dropped off at your front door and never have to see anyone. You can watch the latest movie on your TV, have popcorn delivered from wherever, or whatever you want to eat from wherever, and never have to look at another human being, and you can go to the movies. Even the work that we do. How many people work from home, right? More and more and more and more people are having to work from home, and the most interaction that they have is a Zoom meeting once a day. People are becoming more and more isolated. More and more lonely, right? And I think COVID made it worse. I read an article about a month ago, and I tried to find it. I couldn't find it. Out of all the major metropolitan areas in the United States, Denver ranked number one in loneliness. Now, maybe that's because so many people are in here. They don't have the network. I don't know what it is. But Denver ranked number one as the loneliest city in the United States. People had fewer friends and spent less time with their friends and had less human interaction than any other major city in the United States. Here's the thing. God made us with a need for other people. God made us that way. First thing God does, even in a perfect world, God looks at Adam, who's in a perfect world, no sin, everything works the way it was supposed to work, and God looks at Adam and said, that's not good. It is not good for that man to be alone. And he didn't just mean Adam. He meant humanity. God made us with a need for interaction with other people. The most introverted of us still needs some sort of human interaction or we go what? Bananas. Tom Hanks, Castaway. You ever see the movie? He needed human interaction so bad that he made a human being out of a volleyball and stuck sticks in its head for hair. That's what happens when human beings don't have human interaction. We talk to a volleyball. God made us with a need for community, for human interaction. God made us in his image, to be outward focused. God created humanity, we were made in the image of God, and the main thing that that means is that we, are holy, that we were holy and righteous like he was. But part of that is that we have his character as well. And God is not self-centered, self-absorbed, inwardly focused, it was outwardly focused, outwardly serving, outwardly looking. There's these strange passages in John that you and I read and don't really understand what Jesus is talking about very well. But Jesus says something like, in his high priestly prayer, he says, 
Father, I, I, I did your will that you might be glorified and you were glorified in me and you helped me and I'm going to leave now so that the Holy Spirit comes. We're sitting there going, what is this talking about? Even among the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, they were focused on each other, not on themselves. Jesus went to the cross to give glory to the Father. Father did everything he could to give Jesus everything he can to help him in his service. Jesus steps out of the way so that the Holy Spirit could come in. They're working together, serving each other. And God made you and I in his image the same way. We were made to serve others, serve God. We talked about that in our first sermon, right? That God-sized, God-shaped hole that only God can fill. But second to that is God made us with a need to serve others, to love others, to give to others, to encourage others. And when we don't do that, we live contrary to the way that God created us, and we're miserable. We are miserable. Because we are not living the way in nature that God made us to be. And yet we have become so <laughs> self-absorbed, so selfish, so self-centered as a society that we don't even like to look at the lady at the checkout. <coughs> Our sinful nature comes in. And it looks at this idea that I am created to serve others, to give to others, to love others as oppressive. It says, why in the world would you ever want to do that? That sounds horrible. You should live for yourself because the only one who's going to take care of you is, is you. And so we want to live self-centered, selfish, self-absorbed lives. And yet we know that that's not the way that we were intended to be and it doesn't work. And all it does is lead to misery, to frustration, to emptiness, to lack of purpose. But we all do it. We all have a little selfishness in us. You do, right? Someone's telling you a story, and they're telling you a story that you can relate to, and immediately that story that they're telling you becomes a story about me. And I'm going to tell you my story, because your, my story is more important than and so their story becomes your story because everything is about me. Someone shows you a picture at a family reunion. Who's the first person that you look at? Yourself. Yeah. yeah. That's a terrible smile. There's 25 people in the picture, and the number one person that you worry about is you, me. We all are that. Something happens and the immediate thought process is, how does this father, how does this affect, how does this uh, 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 make my life difficult, right, burdensome, whatever. Yet that's not the way God intended us to be. That's not our nature. Our nature is to be outward focused, serving, giving to others. So God made things like marriage. To give us an opportunity to live for someone else, to encourage someone else, to give to someone else. He made things like family so that we have opportunities to give to each other, to encourage each other, to support each other, to serve each other. He gave us invented things like friendship. Why is it that we all want friends? Because God put that in us. Opportunity to encourage one another, serve one another. And part of that whole outward other focus that God has put into us, part of fulfilling that, he invented this thing called church. Now, it doesn't mean that he invented or created or ordained this exact setup, but the idea of God's people gathering together for mutual encouragement, mutual service, mutual giving, mutual loving, is God-inspired, God-ordained. You see it in the tabernacle that he asked the Israelites to build and the temple that was built later. You see it in Paul going around the Mediterranean and planting all these churches. That wasn't Paul's inspiration. That was God who said people should gather together. My people need to be gathering together for encouragement. The very reason that you're here, you know this. You know that you need to be gathered here with God's people for your own sake, but not just for your sake for the people around us. 
here's a verse, here's some verses from Hebrews chapter 10. Oh, I'm skipping ahead. All right. Don't really know when Hebrews was written. Sometime in the, in the first century of the Christian church, writer to the Hebrews is writing to the Christians about how the New Testament and Jesus is greater than the Old Testament. And he has a couple of verses in here that talk about the very purpose and meaning of why it is that we gather together in church. This is what it says. And let us consider how we may spur one another on toward love and good deeds, not giving up meeting together as some are in the habit of doing, but encouraging one another, and all the more as you see the day approaching. So let me walk through that. Consider how we may spur one another on, encourage one another, push one another, uh, help one another toward love and good deeds. Love each other, be nice to each other. You guys aren't getting along. Come on, be nice. Do some good things. Don't do some bad things, right? Spur one another on towards love and good deeds. Not giving up meeting together. Not stopping doing this church, as some are in the habit of doing. But encouraging one another. Encouraging That's the purpose of this. We don't get together just for ourselves. Yeah, it's important what I get out of it and what I need, but even more it's important what I give and what I do and how I serve others, how I encourage one another. That's that need for each other that we have. That need to outward focus to serve one another, to give to one another, to encourage one another, to love one another. And church is supposed to be a place where we can do that. When our self-centeredness and our self-absorbedness and our selfishness begins to infiltrate this, that's when it starts to lead to what? Problem. We are here primarily to serve, to encourage, to love our brothers and sisters. You with me? The best illustration that I can come up with is pawpaw trees. Now, I tell I use this illustration all the time, but it, it illustrates what church is very, very well. When I first moved to Antigua, I wanted pawpaw trees. I love pawpaw trees. We have them growing up in Africa. I ate them like crazy. I love them. So I went down to the marketplace and I bought a papaya or a pawpaw tree, cut it open, and I took the seeds out, took the guts out. I buried them all in the ground. And up came about a hundred little baby pawpaw trees. And that's a big one, all right? But they all came up in the same hole, all right? And I, I couldn't find a picture of what I want, so I'm going to have to draw it. All right. So, ready? So out came out of the hole. Up came out of the hole a hundred little pawpaw trees, just like this. They're about as thick as a toothpick, all right? And after they got to be, you see that? Everyone see that? You see that? Those in line, see it? A hundred of them came up. All right? And uh, after they got to be about 10 inches high, 12 inches high, I said, well, let me, let me separate them all out. I don't need, they're not going to grow properly on top of each other right there like that. So let me separate them all out. I don't need a hundred pawpaw trees. That's a lot of pawpaw trees. So I saved about 10 of them and I spread them out like this, right? See that? That night it was windy. And when I came out the next morning, all my pawpaw trees were laying flat on the ground. All right? <clears throat> Why? It had been windy before. <coughs> Antigua was always windy. It didn't blow over here. Why did they blow over here? They didn't have the support of the other papa trees. This is church. We think that we can stand up against the troubles of this world, the temptations of Satan, the difficult things that take place because we live in a broken world on our own. We're fooling ourselves. We need the support, the encouragement, the help, the love that comes from gathering together as God's people. This is church. When we go out on our own and we do this, we get knocked over by the world, by temptations, by troubles, by hardships, by disease. God did not intend for us to be solo Christians living out on our own. He intended us to gather together as a community of God's people for encouragement to one another. And that's why we build. That's 
why we build. Build a place where people can be encouraged in their walk with Christ. We build so that we can have a place where a community of God's people can gather, where we can serve one another and encourage one another and love one another and give to one another and have it all given back again. We build because we know that out there in the world it's hard. And there's sin and there's temptation and there's death and there's destruction and there's the devil. We need a place where we can be encouraged and built up and strengthened where we can fulfill our nature and give and serve to one another. Amen? Our world out there doesn't know this yet. Many in our world don't know this yet. But we hope that somewhere along the line, somehow God makes it clear to them that that hole in their heart, that God-sized, God-shaped hole that only God can fill, moves them to realize that they need the community of the church they, we need to be around God's people and they go looking for some way to fill that hole in their heart and to become all the things that they've tried in the past that haven't worked. Find this one thing that will fill that hole, that need, that, that emptiness that they have. When they come, we need to be ready. We need to be ready to have a welcoming community of believers those from the outside can come and grow in their relationship with God, can, can find a place to serve and to be served, to love and to be loved, to give and to be given to. A place where they can be encouraged in their walk with Christ. Amen? Amen. The gospel changes our view of one another in a dramatic way. Without Christ, without the gospel, without the good news of Jesus dying on the cross, we sit here and we view each other, we compare ourselves to each other, we judge each other. We see each other as competition. We see each other as someone who's trying to get us as danger. The gospel of Jesus Christ, our view of one another, is dramatically changed so that we view each other as objects of love. The same love that God has for me, so I have for one another. And now I want to find a way to serve you, to help you, to encourage you, to strengthen your faith and your relationship with Christ Jesus. And that happens through the community of the church. Now you stop for a minute and think about that. The plan of salvation, the last step of the whole plan of salvation hinges on you and me. Sort of. That's a little spooky. God the Father creates the world and is going to sustain the world and is going to take care of all things and God the Son is going to come down. He's going to pay for the sins of the world. He's going to take our punishment on himself and die. He will rise again to conquer our enemies and give us the victory over all of them. The Holy Spirit will come and by the power of the gospel, by the power of the word, he will change our stubborn hearts, our stone stiff neck, stone hearts and give us a heart of flesh so that we trust and believe in the promises of God. Whenever we hear those promises of God and the message of the gospel then is given to you and me to go and share. So you and I have the gospel. And in some ways we're the weakest link in the whole plan of salvation. Aren't we? Weakest because we get tired and because we forget and we don't know how and we mess it up. Weakest link because we're sinful. Sometimes the church doesn't always do the best job of loving others, loving each other, encouraging each other, protecting each other, giving to each other. Sometimes we do the very opposite. The history of the Christian church is full of examples of Christians not being so nice to other people. Right? And a lot of the people out there in our society and in our community have been hurt by the church. From the obvious abuse right, to the maybe not so obvious by judgmentalism and harshness by not creating a place where they can grow and flourish but in some ways even though we might be the weakest part we are also one of the strong parts God says my grace 
is made perfect in your weakness. It is in our weakness that God's grace shines brighter. And though God has entrusted to us the message of the gospel to share with the world, God promises that through our weakness, and we are, right? Look at us. Right? And I'm not trying to cut any of you down. Right? So what are we trying to do? We're trying to put up this big, nice building out there. Right? What an amazing thing. Yet who are we? We are God's people. That's who we are. And it is through our weakness and our smallness that God's grace is going to shine ever bright. Our brothers and sisters, we build so that we can share the gospel with our community. We build so that the people of our community can find a place where they can grow in their relationship with God. We build so that we, they can find a place to serve and to be served, to love and to be loved. And that design is made to do that. Remember the old time <laughs> church buildings? You guys know these, right? Stairs, yeah, they always have to have stairs, right? You go up the stairs. There's an entryway that's about the size of <coughs> your closet, right? You walk in and you're going to shake each other's hands and you go, you're immediately into the sanctuary. You leave the church. You go out, shake the pastor's hand. You're out in the parking lot already, right? There's all kinds of wasted space in that building. All kinds of it. Got a kitchen, big old kitchen with a pack. Got all this extra space. There's this big hallway. What's the purpose of that hallway? There's even a living room. Who needs a living room at church? There's even some of the drawings have a fireplace in there. What do you need a fireplace in the church for? Sounds ridiculous. Waste of time, waste of space, right? No, it's not. We're designed with the idea of a need for the community of the church. <coughs> Church doesn't just happen when we sit in here and we study God's word and we worship him. Church happens out there in the entryway when we talk to each other after worship. Some of you, when you're out there in I start Bible class at 10.30, you Bible class, Sunday school, and you come in and you say, oh, sorry, I'm late, sorry, I'm late. You don't have to be sorry at all. Church doesn't just happen when we gather around the Bible. Church happens when we are out there encouraging our brothers and sisters in Christ if you're in the middle of a good conversation with someone, growing in your relationship with them, and you come late to Bible class, I am never going to be angry at that. Because that is also the purpose of why we gather. We need that. God made us with a need for each other, with a need for community, for the community of God's people. And so we build a place for God, for the people of our community to reunite with God's people. And so let's bow our heads and say a prayer, all right? I'm going to stop there. <clears throat> Lord God, Heavenly Father, bless our efforts. Thank you for the opportunity, Lord God, to be a part of this. And we pray, Lord, that you would bless our efforts as a church, as a, as a gathering of believers. Pray, Lord God, that you would uh, remove obstacles, that you would make a way so that all this could happen to your glory, Lord God. Help us to build a place where this community can find you, can have their sins forgiven, can be guided by your word, can be encouraged by us. Forgive our sins, Lord God, and help us to always focus on the, the purpose of the church. Uh, keep us united, Lord God. Uh, help us focus on the mission that you have given to us. and Bless our efforts. In Jesus' name we pray. Let's join together in our next hymn. Um, which I don't remember what it is. Uh, first song of Isaiah. Let's stand and join together.